very happy evening to my dear friends and esteemed members of the Institutes of Chartered Accountants India. Today is just not yet another Sunday. Today, being a World Music Day, I extend my greetings to all the musicians in the world. Amid the COVID-19 pandemic, we are observing the International Yoga Day at our home with our family members. Let us make yoga a part of our daily life, which brings peace and harmony. I deem it my privilege to welcome you all to our first webinar on the topic Overview of General Clauses Act 1897 and Overview of Interpretation of Statutes for CA intermediate students. For those of you who are just joining us live, a warm welcome. I now request Sri Madhumita Ma'am, Chairperson, Students Committee, to address our students. Uh, thank you, Annapurni. I uh, welcome all the students. Uh, on behalf of Kanchi from Sikasa, uh, nice to see so many students coming live. Um, as you all know, uh, today is a yoga day, music day, and uh, the Father's Day. Uh, today, guest speaker is Madam uh, Muthu Abirami. She is a well-known practicing advocate as well as chartered accountants. She is an excellent mentor for you, and she will give you so many inputs which will be relevant and useful for your exams. Our Kanchipuram branch has developed over the years with excellent infrastructure on IT labs, classrooms, study hall, library, etc. In today's pandemic scenario, under the able guidance of our Kanchipuram branch chairperson CA Geeta Madam and Sikasa chairman CA Satyanarayana sir, and with excellent Sikasa student team members, our branch has now embraced a new normal of online learning for both members as well as the students. The ultimate aim of Kanchipuram Sikasa is to connect with the students and to work for their welfare and their knowledge. Compared to elders, I definitely know that you youngsters will adapt the technology far better. Coming from to the exam point of view, we see many students getting confused, uh, getting irritated, frustrated, and lacking focus with respect to the present exam because of various options which are never available to us before, opt out, etc., etc., change in exam centers, etc. So what I suggest is you all have an exam date in mind, right? So keep focusing on the exams. You prepare. So whatever, I mean, whatever is your exam, you keep preparing. It is an excellent opportunity to revise all the theory and work out all the problems for which earlier you complained that you did not have enough time. So no preparation will go waste. No study material, whatever sincere efforts you have put in, nothing will go waste. Okay, it will go and add in your kitty as marks. It will definitely be translated into your marks. So focus towards the exam. Other point of view is your health. What should you do for your health? Keep yourself physically and mentally fit. As today is a yoga day, start doing some yoga. Start doing some exercise. Keep connected to your friends and your family through calls, WhatsApp, etc. That I think I need not tell you. So... And after that, what you have to do is that keep your mind fresh and alive so that you can study and whatever you study, it gets into your mind. So with this, I thank uh, the Kanchi from Sikasa for giving me wonderful opportunity to speak with you all today, the young and bright mind. So keep your mind fresh, study well, triple S, study well, stay home, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, Anupurmi. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for your uh, motivating words to kickstart the session and our preparation for our exams. I now request Vaishnavi BS, member of our KPM Sikasa, to introduce the eminent speaker for today's session, CA Muthu Abhirami, ma'am. Over to you, Vaishnavi. Yes. Good evening. It's a glad welcome to bring you this evening filled with the desires, hopes, and dreams we all share. It's my pleasure to extend a cheerful welcome for the speaker today, C.A. Muthu Abhirami Ma'am. She is a practicing advocate. She completed law from the School of Excellence in Pala and she is a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India. She holds a postgraduate degree in law and specializes in business laws. She also holds a diploma in international taxation 
awarded by the Institute of Tamil Accountants of India. She specializes in tax litigation and tax advice theory and appears before various appellate forums. Apart from taxation, she also handles cases before NCLG. She was the chairman of the Electrax Committee and Research Committee constituted by the Transcurrent Bank of SIRC of ICR for the year 2019-20. She is a guest faculty for LLM taxation in Tamil Nadu at the Ambedkar Law University, Taiwan. She has presented papers on technical topics in various forums like SIRC of ICI branches, NCP study circles of SIRC of ICI, Revenue Board Association, All India Federation of Tax Practitioners, Chartered Accountant Study Circle. While she was a student, she served as a vice chairperson, student representative of Southern India Chartered Accountancy Student Association, SIKASA, for the 2008 month. She has participated and won prizes in a number of oratorical and debate competitions at school, college, and SARs. She has acted as a judge for mood for competitions and oratorical competitions conducted for the student. Yes, we have a great opportunity today, and with your help, map, we will enjoy the best knowledgeable discussion and learning today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vaishnavi. Over to you, Mutabirami, ma'am. I uh, hope you all will enjoy this session and make the best out of it. Thank you. Thank you, Vaishnavi. Thank you, Annapurni, and thank you, Madhu, ma'am. Uh, I feel extremely happy to be here. Uh, this is my alma mater, and uh, uh, it's, a, it's a great privilege to be uh, here today. Uh, before we go on to the topic for the day, uh, I would like to uh, tell you a few words about your examination. Uh, Madhu Ma'am has uh, given you a uh, few tips on how to handle the situation. From my part, I will also add to, like to add a few words on that. Uh, see, this course as such, the Chartered Accountancy course, whether you are in Inter or Final or even CPT for that matter, you have to think that this is a, a tapasya, a davam. You are awaiting for the boon of God. So you have to keep preparing. You, you don't know when you will get that boon, but you have to keep preparing. So it, it is sim uh, similar to that uh, tapasya, similar to this davam, you have to uh, keep focusing on your studies, keep preparing. You, you don't have to worry about when the exam is. You focus on what is required. You focus on what is within your control. Your control, what is within your control is studying for the examination, preparing for the examination. That is within your control. Examination date or the subsequent events that happen in the course of uh, your exams or after the exams are not within your control. So focus on the things that are within your control. God will help you to achieve things that are not within your control. The results you will have very positive result but so focus only on what is within your control so prepare well for your exam think this as a tapasya and do your best don't wander your mind or energy in other things that do not matter to you if you apply for only one group you can prepare for both the groups and be ready like mother ma'am said whatever you study it is not going to go as a waste your your study material the preparation whatever it is there in your brain it is going to be there only so ensure uh, ensure that you focus on what is most needed. That is one thing that I wanted to say. Second thing is that, that you focus on the institute publications. Whatever the institute gives as its publications, right from study material, uh, your suggested answers, your revision test papers, uh, your mock test papers. I, I am given to understand that you don't have uh, practice manual now, but other uh, so many other publications are there uh, given by the institute so you focus on the materials given by the institute be thorough with the materials given by the institute success cannot elude you at all so anybody if you ask people who have passed either in the recent times or in the past or 20 years back 30 years back 40 years back no matter what they will all have one common thing to say that is prepare thoroughly the study material Focus on the study material. That is most important. Now, 
coming to the subject point of view today the topic that we will be dealing is an overview of general clauses act and interpretation of statutes syllabus as appearing for ca intermediate students so even for these topics these areas interpretation of statutes and the general clauses act you have to focus on the study material provided by the institute i went through your last four or uh, five question papers that is available in the website when i went through that all i could see is that every question that is there in the question paper is picked out from your study material either a direct question or an application oriented question a concept will be there in your study material based on that concept you have to apply that concept and answer the question you have to answer based on the application so the questions have not uh, it has not uh, gone out of your textbook so application questions are there so you focus on the material study material you will be able to answer the question paper so this is very very important while preparing for exam now coming to the overview uh, first i will deal with the uh, interpretation of statutes uh, this is uh, much uh, slight i would say slightly on a higher uh, importance uh, than the uh, general clauses act so i will focus on interpretation of statutes first we will deal with certain important aspects uh, certain important cases certain important principles desired in interpretation and after this we will uh, go go through the general clauses act certain important aspects of general clauses act this we will uh, do it today and i also found that about uh, 12 to 16 marks it is being asked from interpretation of statutes and uh, general clauses act put together so about uh, you can say anywhere on an average you can say 13 14 marks you can easily score if you are thorough with these uh, two uh, chapters and uh, if you uh, take uh, the syllabus to be studied for these two chapters it is quite easy i will tell you it is quite easy and uh, based uh, with this introduction we will now uh, move on to interpretation of statutes and overview in the first place okay so this interpretation of statutes what is this interpretation of statutes see we have all studied uh, by in, in school times at civics we have all studied civics in school times so we know that there are three branches of the government the legislature the executive and the judiciary so the legislature the parliament it enacts a law the executive is that branch or that wing of the government which ensures that that uh, which ensures that these laws are Uh, uh, carried out the rules and procedures given in the act in the legislation is carried out and judiciary has this function of interpreting the uh, law passed by the parliament so there is a clear division among these three branches and what should follow is only the rule of law that is whatever is there in the law that should be followed so all these laws are subject to Uh, the constitutional provisions so constitution is the mother provision so mother law it's a mother enactment so any law that is being passed by the indian parliament should uh, should should, uh, should be within the four uh, touchstones within the four cornerstones of the uh, constitution so any law that is being passed in india should come within the framework of constitution if it is beyond the constitution then we call it as ultra virus u l t r a v i r e s ultra virus the constitution so such a law such a law which is beyond the constitution which is not conforming to the provisions of constitution will be struck down as uh, void or uh, it will be struck down as void so this is something that you keep uh, coming across uh, in many of the statutes that you study so whether this provision is ultra virus or not Uh, whether this provision is within the uh, framework of constitution this is something that we all uh, come across quite often so as i said any law should be within the framework of constitution and such a law should be applied for various facts for various situations for various disputes so there could be two people there could be some dispute one person says that a property belongs to him other person says the property does it, uh, belongs to him so there is a property dispute say for example there is a property dispute in whose favor should this property uh, be uh, this dispute should be solved for example if you take that there are very many legislations present 
based on the application of these legislations, the dispute will be settled by the court of law. So while settling this dispute, the court will interpret the legislation. So this is the basic of uh, interpretation of statutes. So as far as the syllabus is concerned, you it deals with interpretation of statutes, deeds, documents and uh, instruments. So statute like uh, like we all know, it is the written uh, bill of the legislature. It is the um, it, it is a law that is enacted by the parliament, by the legislative authority. Then if you take a document, document is defined in Evidence Act. Document is also defined uh, in, in your uh, General Process Act also, what a document means. So it is basically a paper, it is a material thing and it gives you the information, proof or evidence of anything. So this is a document. Uh, I am give uh, at present. I am dealing with. I'm uh, just giving you an introduction uh, type. We will deal certain aspects in depth going forward. Okay. So, General Process Act states that uh, document it shall include any matter which is written, expressed, or described upon any substance by means of letters, figures, or marks, or by more than one of those means which is intended to be used or which may be used for the purpose of recording this matter. So basically, a document means something should be in writing and it should state about some matter, something about something, it should be in a written form, in a, in a paper or in any other substance. So this is basically a document. Now instrument, instrument means it is a legal document and it creates or records a fact. It creates or records a fact. It is a formal writing. Like an agreement can be said to be an instrument. A deed can be said to, an, said to be an instrument. Uh, so these things uh, can be said to be an instrument. Now, interpretation we saw. And uh, uh, what is the interpretation we saw? That is to ascertain the meaning of, uh, to ascertain the meaning of the words given by the legislature. Now, interpretation, if you, uh, if you take the classification of interpretation, interpretation can be classified into two aspects, into two types. One is the legal interpretation, other one is the doctrinal interpretation. So this legal interpretation uh, is further subdivided into authentic interpretation and usual interpretation. This authentic interpretation, what does this authentic interpretation means? There are two examples which we can give for uh, for understanding what an authentic uh, interpretation means. See, if the parliament is going to say, I am, I have enacted the law. So if you have any doubt in the law, you come to me and I will clarify the doubt. Then this is authentic interpretation. That is the person who is uh, enacting the law himself will clear the doubts concerning the particular law. So two instances are that Justinian Code, Prussian Code and Justinian Code, in these two cases, uh, what was there in the code is that if you have any doubts about the terms or meanings that are appearing in the, in the legislation, in the act, in the statute, then you come to us. The Justinian said, you come to me for interpretation. I will tell you what is the meaning of that particular word. This is authentic interpretation. Usual interpretation, uh, interpretation when we mean, usual interpretation is it arises out of a custom or a case law. Like how a particular word is used for a long time. We will see a lot of examples. I can give you a lot of examples. We will deal in a short while from now. So how a particular word is used for a, for a very many number of years as a customary practice, as a customary usage, how this is being used. That is one thing. Second thing is that uh, case laws, law of precedence, case laws. Case laws is a very important aspect in the uh, uh, when we are dealing with interpretation of statutes. Uh, you should uh, uh, be aware of the law of binding precedence. That is to say, when a Supreme Court passes a law, that becomes the law of the land and all other lower authorities whether it is a high court or a tribunal or a commission of income tax appeals or all other subsequent bodies should follow the law that is being laid down by Supreme Court. 
Similarly, the hierarchy will be there. If a high court passes a particular, uh, uh, I mean, if, if a high court gives an interpretation, there is a judgment of the high court. Then that judgment of the high court is binding throughout the jurisdiction where that high court is uh, acting. Wherever that, uh, that jurisdiction where the high court is present, throughout the jurisdiction, the judgment provided by the high court will be binding upon the authorities below. So we have further uh, uh, other uh, related provisions concerning the law of binding precedents. So just as an overview, if you, if you take any law that is declared by Supreme Court, it becomes a law of the land. It, uh, then any uh, uh, judgment which is passed by the high court, all other subordinate courts and authorities have to follow that. So this is a law of binding precedents. So case law. So this case law is also one of the important uh, uh, ingredient in the classification of interpretation. So this case, so this covers one aspect of the uh, classification, that is the legal classification. One is authentic and one is usual. The second classification is the doctrinal. Under doctrinal, we have two subclassifications. One is uh, one is the grammatical way. Second one is the logical way. Grammatical way is if, if you take grammatical way by and large all the statutes should be interpreted in a grammatical way. That is the cardinal rule, that is the thumb rule. What is that? Whatever the letter of the law states, if the law states a particular sentence, you should not go beyond the intention. You could not go beyond the spirit. You should not try to ascertain what it means or not. If there is a particular word, if there is a particular sentence, enactment in the statute, it has to be followed straight away in its grammatical sense, in its literal sense. So this we can also call as literal interpretation. Literal interpretation is you just go look into the grammatical meaning, whatever is the uh, meaning that you can understand out of the words written in the statute, you take that as the meaning. You don't go beyond what is the spirit or what is the meaning uh, in the sense what is the spirit and in what context was this made. All these things you don't go. It is written like this and I'm going with this. This is the interpretation. So in its grammatical sense, that is your uh, grammatical way of interpretation. And your uh, logical way is uh, looking beyond the letter of the law, looking into the spirit of the law. You see uh, in what context these lines were made, these enactment, this enactment was made. In what context was it made? What was the intention of the legislature in making this particular enactment, in making this particular provision. You travel beyond the words and see the true intention, true spirit of the legislation. That is called your logical way. And we have many further uh, subdivisions and uh, subroutes which we will deal shortly. Okay. So prima facie, if you look at the classification, it is legal and doctrinal. Under legal, you have authentic and usual. Under doctrinal, you have grammatical and logical. Authentic is the person who is making the law, who is enacting the law will clarify the doubts arising out of it. Usual means it is uh, the interpretation that is arising out of uh, customary principles and case laws. Then when it comes to doctrinal, one is grammatical, another is logical. Grammatical is not looking beyond the uh, letters or the words that are inscribed in the statute and uh, logical is going beyond, traveling beyond the words of the statute, trying to ascertain the intention, the spirit of the statute. Like uh, we say substance over form. So what is the true substance? What is the true intention? What is the true spirit? You try to ascertain it through the logical method. Okay. Um, then interpretation and construction. See, basically, uh, if you look at it, there is no great difference between interpretation and construction. Yet, uh, there is a small uh, differentiation. There is a small difference that you can bring up, uh, bring about with when it comes to interpretation and construction. So interpretation is finding out the true sense of any form, and construction is uh, uh, drawing conclusion with respect to uh, the words that are there beyond the words, beyond the direct expression. So in a way, you can say uh, interpretation is something like uh, the literal classification, whereas Construction is something like the logical uh, classification of interpretation. We can try to say, but as such, these two words are used interchangeably. But from your exam perspective, if at all a difference is being asked, a question on difference between interpretation and construction, you may write it this way as given in your study material.
so this is one thing and uh, next we move on to the various uh, rule, uh, process of interpretation how uh, interpretation should be carried out what are the various processes by which uh, interpretation can be achieved okay the first uh, uh, assistance the first aid to interpretation process is statutory and the second process is non statutory statutory is further subdivided into two one is the general process act second is the specific definitions contained in the individual acts non statutory is further subdivided into two one is the common law rules of interpretation second is the case law relating to the interpretation of statute so now we dealt with what is interpretation so whenever you are dealing with interpretation we saw the thumb rule that it has to be literal whatever is the meaning that you go with that and only uh, most important aspect of interpretation is you resort to interpretation when there is any sort of ambiguity in the statute when a word is capable of giving two meanings or more meanings when there is some sort of uh, ambiguity some sort of confusion some sort of lack of clarity in the enactment in the statute in the words then you go for the process of interpretation try to ascertain the true meaning so that is basically the uh, the first principle so as long as the words are unambiguous as long as the words are clear you go with the literal interpretation just take the words from the statute and go with it whenever there is any sort of ambiguity or confusion or lack of clarity then you go to the process of interpretation assisted by the various aids that we dealt with now one is statutory aids of interpretation second is non statutory interpretation statutory if you take general process act if there is any confusion with regard to any word then you go to general process act suppose see i will deal with certain examples where um okay i'll come to it later where a word is there in a particular statute and similarly appearing uh, definition was also there in general process act how we uh, differentiate I, i'll just deal with it so as of now uh, when it comes to statutory interpretation general process act is there when the particular legislation is silent about a definition see normally every act will contain definition you take income tax act you take uh, companies law there will be a definition if a definition is absent you go to general process act to see what the meaning is number 1 number 2 there could be specific definitions in the individual act itself or similar acts say an appeal procedure in income tax and other uh, tax legislation indirect tax legislation wherever it appears similar like we call in pari materia we will deal with that wherever it appears similar you can take the clue from the other laws if uh, the definition is absent or missing from the parent legislation suppose we are dealing with income tax act if there is a definition that is not there in the act if you can borrow that definition from some other uh, act that you can take so this is statutory interpretation non statutory is common law rules of interpretation and case laws so what is this common law see uh we in india we follow the britishers britishers followed the system of common law system there are two law system if you say civil law and common law system you can do your research when you find some time uh, there are two uh, uh, jurisprudence kind of law uh, system of uh, jurisprudence one is common law system and one is civil law system in india we follow common law system common law system is basically shaped out in a variety of way by uh, judicial precedents judge made laws is a very important aspect of common law system okay and whereas when it comes to civil law system they give a lot of importance to the court it is overlapping by and large it is overlapping you cannot uh, follow a strict uh, demarcation between civil law system and common law system another important aspect of uh, civil law system is that in civil law system the judge will be like a principal investigator he will try to investigate the dispute and try to arrive at a solution in common law system the court or the judge he will listen to the uh, arguments placed by the advocates he will listen to the documents placed by the advocates in arriving at the uh, conclusion for that particular dispute so this is another striking feature of a civil law system and common law system so uh, this common law rules of interpretation is also another uh, assistance for the process of interpretation 
then you have the case laws relating to interpretation see various case laws will decide as to how a particular statute will be uh, should be interpreted uh, i will give you this very classic example tax statutes you take uh, income, uh, any tax tax statutes income tax or indirect tax for that matter tax statutes should be interpreted in a strict manner that is to say if the legislation brings within its definition or fold only certain category like a b c only three categories of people are taxed and there is a doubt about whether a fourth category could be brought within the ambit of third category or not okay i'm give, i'm repeating the example there are about three categories of people who can be taxed it is given for an, uh, uh, for uh, assuming for a moment in the law and a fourth category of person is there there is a doubt as to whether this fourth category of person can also be brought within the purview of third category or not in such a case the rule of interpretation is that it should be interpreted strictly that is if it includes only 1 2 3 4 person should not be included for that matter so it should be strictly interpreted so no room should be given for uh, uh, extending the piece of legislation so strict interpretation is required take the very same income tax act for a beneficial provision for an exemption provision okay for an exemption provision the thumb rule of interpretation is that for an exemption provision it should be interpreted strictly in favor of the department in favor of the revenue if it comes to the taxing statute charging mechanism charging provisions or taxing provision that should be interpreted strictly and it should be in the favor of the assessee if two rules of interpretation is possible it should be in the favor of the assessee whereas if it is going to be a beneficial provision an exemption provision then it should be interpreted strictly and in favor of the department so only if a b c all the conditions are followed only then the exemption will be available suppose an exemption section says that these are the conditions to be followed for claiming exemption then all the conditions should be fulfilled for claiming exemption because exemption provision is a, a extension of benefit to the assessee and this should be interpreted strictly but in favor of the department see having said this um we have very many legislations of beneficial provisions concerning uh, exemptions and capital gain if you see various case laws decided uh, regarding exemptions and capital gains normally it will be interpreted in these days of late if you see many judgments will be interpreted in favor of this stating that it's a beneficial legislation but there is a recent uh, supreme court judgment and also there are there were many very many judgments which held that an exemption notification an exemption provision should be interpreted strictly in favor of the department that is to say the person claiming the exemption should have followed all the conditions should have fulfilled all the conditions to claim that exemption only then that exemption will be allowed so this is the thumb rule so this case law interpretation case law relating to the interpretation of statutes this is also one of the non statutory aids that is uh, there in the process of interpretation this will assist you in the process of interpretation so where are we now we are in the process of interpretation what are the base uh, what are the assistances you can get in the process of interpretation statutory and non statutory we saw the various examples now uh, the primary rules of interpretation so it can be broadly classified into uh, the primary the rules of interpretation can be broadly classified into primary rule and secondary rule primary rule if you take it is the uh, rule of literal construction reasonable construction harmonious construction beneficial construction exceptional construction ejus tam charges secondary rules is effect of usage that is the custom and uh, associated words to be understood in a common sense manner that is not necessary associa there is a rule i will deal with it shortly okay uh, having dealt with uh, uh, beneficial pro uh, provisions i would also like to add this you take a uh, legislation concerning labor welfare uh, say for example uh, a maternity uh, benefit act or uh, uh, industrial disputes act anything that is concerning uh, the uh, welfare of the labor so these should be interpreted in favor of the subjects in favor of the people who are the beneficiaries because these laws are enacted specifically for the benefit of the particular section of people the Uh, the workers the laborers uh, the pe uh, people who will be benefited out of this legislation 
the workers as such. So any provision concerning these statutes should be beneficially interpreted in favor of these subjects. So one, one is the example I gave on income tax act. Another you can take this example also when it comes to uh, case laws concerning the interpretation of various legislations. Okay. Now, literal construction, we saw some time back that it should be strictly, uh, uh, it should be interpreted strictly within uh, whatever the uh, language that you can understand, whatever the meaning that you can ascribe to the language that is used in the statute, only that you, it, only that you can uh, uh, interpret, only to that extent you can go, you cannot travel beyond it, this is your literal interpretation. But even when you are doing a literal interpretation, you should see the object or the purpose for which that law was uh, enacted. For what purpose that law was enacted? What purpose that provision is there in the law? Based on that, you have to do this literal interpretation. Take an example where, uh, 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 where disclosure of interest, disclosure of interest concerning a director has to be given at the time of a board meeting or during the time of annual general meeting. So disclosure should be with respect to the nature of uh, the law says, uh, the provision says, disclosure of the nature of concern or interest, financial or otherwise it says. So here, this section should be interpreted in a broader sense in that, uh, uh, so as to say, whatever type of interest it could be, all that interest should be disclosed fully and truly. Because that is the very object of that section. The directors who are there, they should uh, they should uh, disclose what is their interest in the particular transaction. When they are disclosing that, it has to they have to disclose it in a full and complete manner. Excuse me. <coughs> so they should uh, the director should disclose it in a. Uh, uh, they should disclose in a full and frank manner. So this is one thing. So this is literal interpretation. Second, in literal interpretation also, <coughs> words that are used in popular sense, words that are used in popular sense, they should be given meaning in their popular sense itself. Okay. I will give you certain examples wherein you can understand uh, this particular concept easily. See, uh, there, will, uh, there is this case law where tax uh, cement was to be taxed. It's an indirect tax registration. Uh, uh, they wanted to tax cement. So the word used was cement. Cement will come under the purview of taxation. Okay, that is the basic uh, basic aspect over there. So cement will be taxed. This particular company used uh, a substitute for cement called as limpo. A substitute for cement called limpo. This is basically made out of lime and porcelain. So this is a chemical component they make as a substitute for cement. This can be used. So they uh, made use of this limpo. Now the question is, th this statute wanted to tax cement. Whether it would uh, include even limpo, whether it would include even a substitute of the cement. The court said, when the word cement was introduced in the was there in the section in, in was there in the legislature, what the law intended to tax was only the cement, because cement has to be understood in its popular sense. So normally, when you uh, say cement, we all know the cement that we use uh, in a in a in a popular sense. How the traders use that, how the common public would use it. So only that can be taxed. Any any substitute of that cement, like limpo, like lime and uh, puzzlelana in this particular case. So these cannot be brought within the ambit of cement. So words which are used in the popular sense, they have to be interpreted in, in such a way that how uh, a common man, how it is used in the popular sense. Only in that way, it can be interpreted. So uh, how the traders, how the people who are uh, dealing with that particular commodity, who will be affected by that legislation, who will be benefited by that legislation, how they will see that particular word. In that sense only, the word can be interpreted. You get it, all of you? So, when a word is there in a popular sense, it has to be given the meaning in its popular sense only. This is one example. Second example is coal. Whether coal would be uh, coming under the purview of taxation or not. What is meant by this coal? Coal, whether it includes coal as obtained as a mineral also, or 
coal would mean uh, as such charcoal charcoal see again the court used this uh, methodology of popular word should be used in its popular sense and stated that when it is coal common public would also think about charcoal so coal doesn't stop with coal even charcoal has to be included within the terminology of coal so it doesn't stop with just coal obtained as a mineral but even the charcoal can be taxed that is one thing in fact uh, in that judgment it didn't say that coal obtained as a mineral coal means as such charcoal also so that is one aspect of it but if the legislation is concerning a colliery control order what is colliery control colliery control order it is are uh, 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 concerning mines and minerals how to uh, regulate the uh, work regarding mines and minerals so that is colliery control order so this colliery control order is very specific it is very technical to the people who are who will be benefited or affected out of the legislation so in that legislation or in that order when coal is used it cannot include charcoal when coal is used it can include only coal obtained as a mineral for this particular uh, order for this particular piece of legislation or order it should be only coal obtained as a mineral whereas if it is going to be uh, taxing statutes where common public will be affected where the traders will be affected or the manufacturers in if it is going to be excise duty they, they will be affected then coal would include even charcoal that is the interpretation no we we'll also give the another example on vegetables the word vegetable so vegetables uh, in this case vegetables are not to be taxed vegetables are not to be taxed whether beetle leaves whether beetle leaves would come within the term of vegetable the court stated that vegetable means that we grow in the farm or a kitchen garden basically so normal in the popular sense beetle leaves would not mean as vegetable therefore beetle leaves would would not be classified as vegetable and beetle leaf would be taxed this is it having said this i will also deal with three or four other examples in a similar fashion ginger the interpretation of ginger green ginger interpretation of uh, lemon interpretation of uh, uh, lemon and uh, chili lemon chili and green ginger coconut coconut lemon chili green uh, green ginger the interpretation of these words whether they would come into the term vegetable uh, vegetable or not whether they would fit in within the term vegetable or not it traveled up to supreme court interestingly supreme court held coconut would not come under the term vegetable coconut we are using it for the purpose of enhancing the taste of a food but it is not a table food one cannot have coconut as a vegetable in the sense one can have it coconut as a table food so coconut was held to be not falling within the purview of vegetable whereas green ginger uh, chili and uh, uh, green ginger chili and lemon they were held to be coming within the terminology of vegetable because in the normal sense when you talk about vegetable people would also understand uh, green chili uh, 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 green ginger chili and uh, lemon so in the normal sense people would ascribe the uh, meaning of this words to vegetables therefore it it would be vegetables even uh, the, the even uh, uh, chili or lemon are not table foods per se they cannot be classified as a vegetable in, in a botanical sense they are not vegetable so people who try uh, the uh, advocates when they argue for this matter they try to bring in the botanical meaning they try to bring in the technical meaning lot of literature on that say but the court stated that what we are not looking at the technical sense we are not looking at the botanical sense how a word will be construed in the popular manner only that we are seeing so accordingly beetle leaves were held as not vegetables coconut was not held uh, uh, was held as not vegetable whereas the other uh, uh, green ginger chili and lemon were held as vegetables okay so this is uh, the terminology of words being used in a popular sense then uh next uh, aspect that we will deal is with respect to exact meaning should be preferred to do uh, should be preferred to loose meaning see if a word has an exact meaning and if a word also has a loose meaning then what you should prefer is only the exact meanings in a case adjoining adjoining the meaning of exact meaning of adjoining is coterminous the loose uh, meaning of the word is neighborhood nearby 
The court stated that if adjoining, if the word is used as adjoining in the statute, the exact meaning must be preferred. Having said this, there is yet another aspect to this exact meaning. When you have an exact meaning, there will also be a secondary meaning. You should not confuse the secondary meaning with the loose meaning. But normally, exact meaning should be preferred over loose meaning. But if there is a secondary meaning, which is not a loose meaning, have a secondary meaning, but that is not a loose meaning. Secondary meaning should be preferred. So this is another aspect concerning legislation, interpretation. Then I would like to take you through another aspect where this is the concept of causes omissus. Like when you are interpreting a statute, you cannot fill in the gap. Suppose there is a gap. Suppose you perceive that there is a gap. You cannot fill in that gap. You cannot uh, uh, fill what is supposed to be or what was supposedly omitted by the legislature. That you cannot do. You have to assume that the legislation in its wisdom has drafted this. So you cannot uh, go and supplement and supplant and assume the gap. That is not possible. But you can do it then that filling the gap is essential for reasonably constructing the statute itself, for understanding the meaning of the statute, for reasonably constructing it, for removing any conflict, for bringing up an harmonious thing. In such cases, you can fill in the gap. In the normal circumstances, you cannot fill in any gap in the legislation, but you can, uh, you can do it in an extraordinary circumstance, provided that is within the framework of law, and it is needed for uh, for a harmonious interpretation, for uh, bringing effect to that statute itself. In such cases, that can be done. But it should be done in very extraordinary cases, not in all cases. Uh, then I will take you through another important aspect of rule of reasonable construction. So in this rule, uh, you have to understand this uh, Latin uh, maxim. Ut res magis valiet Quum pariet. Ut res magis valiet quum pariet. So this means if you can, uh, you, you should always try to give effect to a word rather than making it as a nullity. Wherever possible, you should always try and enhance the meaning, try and give effect to the words of the statute rather than making it a zero or rather than making it as a nullity. That is the key aspect to it. So whenever possible, you have to try and make all the words in the statute operative. You should not make any word as a nullity, any word as a void. A, a piece of legislation is there. You cannot omit a particular word, saying that this word doesn't have any meaning. I'm not taking into consideration this word at all. But rather, you should try and ascribe and give some meaning to the words. So wherever possible, you should give effect to a thing rather than invalidating it. That is the uh, meaning of this Latin term. So you should not make a thing void. To put it very simply, you should not make a thing void. You should validate it. Wherever it is required, you should validate it and you should not make it as a void. So that sort of reasonable interpretation, reasonable construction must be given. Uh, I will uh, give you an example for this. Um, this is a case. Uh, Okay, inter students, you, I want you to slightly understand a little bit on uh, appeals also. I'll, I'll just take you to it's very simple. I'll just take you to that because this example is based on it. When you're aggrieved by an order, you can go on an appeal. You understand that? When you're aggrieved by an order, you go on an appeal. If you're aggrieved by an assessment order, you go on an appeal. So you fill the written, you, after filling the written, you file the written. After filing the written, the case is taken up for scrutiny by the department and you are finding some, uh, you are agreed out of the order, then you take it on an appeal. So this appeal is provided in the statute, it is there in the statute, okay? Not only for orders, even for tedious also there is an appeal. How tedious appeal in the sense? You all have to deduct, in, wherever uh, the law states that tax has to be deducted at source, in all those cases, tax has to be deducted at source, okay? After you deduct the tax, you have to deposit, right? Where the law mandates that you have to deduct, you have to deduct and deposit. But you are questioning the very deduction or the deposit itself. See, I'm the person, I'm going to give some income, some uh, payment. I'm going to make a payment to another person, which should be the other person's income, right? When I'm making a payment to another person, that would, in, in very many cases, that payment would be the other, other person's income, okay? When I'm making this payment, 
I have to deduct TDS if it is mandated by the law. Suppose I'm making a, a payment for professional services, 194 days. Suppose I'm making a payment for professional services. Then tax has to be deducted for the payment I make. I am making a payment to another person and I have to deduct tax for uh, when I'm making the payment. Okay. Now when I am making the deduction, after I deduct, I have to deposit it. Right? Now I deduct and deposit. But I I I I say that I am not required to deduct. I say that I am not required to deduct. The law stating that you have to deduct and deposit is not applicable to me. Suppose I say this, I dispute the very uh, deduction itself. In such a case, after uh, the order, I can uh, after this uh, deduction order, I uh, I can also go on an appeal against this that I need not deduct. I can go on an appeal against this. Okay. In this case. The person who is deducting the tax, he deducted and deposited it, he went on an appeal. The appeal commissioner has held that, yes, uh, you need not uh, deduct tax in this particular case. So, uh, your contention is right. You need not deduct uh, the tax in this particular case. There is no doubt about it. So, as a corollary, uh, when the person is stating that I am not required to deduct tax, I am asking for the refund. I am saying, okay, I have deducted tax, so you give me the refund. Commissioner says that I will not give you the refund because that uh, portion of deduction, the other person to whom I have, you have made the payment, he will claim it as a credit. Correct? When I am making a payment to someone, someone for professional services, I am deducting tax. The person to whom I am making the payment, they can claim uh, this tax reduction as their tax credit, right? So the commissioner stated that that other person can claim this as credit. So I'm not going to give it as a refund. In any in any case, the portion of uh, uh, payment that you have deducted is termed as an income. Therefore, it doesn't belong to you. So I'm not going to refund this to you. This was the interpret. Uh, this was the uh, rationale given by the commissioner of income tax. He accepted that tax need not be deducted. He accepted the contention of the SSC that tax need not be deducted. But he stated that I will uh, not give you the refund. Matter traveled to the court to the tribunal. The tribunal said that, see, a person who was deducted, he is given a right of an appeal under the statute, section 248 of the Income Tax Act. Under 248, he is given a right to go on an appeal against this, questioning this deduction itself. Then the law gives him this right. Okay. If the person is not entitled to the uh, refund, then what difference does it make whether he wins or loses? I win, I don't get any refund. I lose, I don't get any refund. Right? When, when I'm on an appeal under section 248 against tax reduction, whether I win, whether I lose, if the refund is not going to be given to me, then there is no difference to me at all. That means the very provision of section 248 is made as a nuggetary, is made as void if this interpretation is accepted. This interpretation, if the interpretation of the Commission of Income Tax Appeals is accepted, that no refund needs to be given to the person who has directed the tax. Then the entire provision of section 248 becomes an agreement. That we will not allow it to happen. Because wherever possible, we have to validate a thing rather than making it as void. We have to validate a thing rather than making it a void thing. So therefore, refund has to be allowed for that person. So this was the judgment uh, rendered by the court in the context of this principle of uh, uterus uh, magus valiate to a valiate. Okay, then another uh, judgment I will tell you. This is pertaining to um, stay. When it means stay, uh, I'll explain you this. Assessment order is passed. Okay, as I said, you fill the return, file the return, case is taken up of scrutiny, assessment order is passed. After assessment order is passed, what will happen? The department will say, You give me the money. They will want to recover the money from you, right? The department says you uh, demand. They will raise a demand stating that uh, after passing an order, uh, they will suppose in that case they are raising a demand. They are stating that you have to pay the government this much money. This is called as demand. Okay, there will be a demand to the uh, uh, there will be demand as appearing in the assessment order. You have to make this payment. This is the demand. After the order is passed, they will wait for thirty days. Thirty days is the time limit given for the assessor to file an appeal. They wait for thirty days. On thirtieth day, what they will do? They are having the rights to uh, recover the demand from you. They will say, come on, give me that demand money. How they will do? If you are not making the payment, they can attach your bank accounts. 
they can attach your assets. There are recovery provisions are separate. Okay, so they can uh, seek this demand. Now, if there is such a demand, what happens on thirty first on thirtieth day? I am going and filing an appeal. Okay, before the commission of income tax. Then what? Immediately, what I will say? I pray for stay of recovery. That means what I will say? Please don't recover that money from me. I am on an appeal. I think I have a good case. I in the sense, assessee. Assessee will say, I think I have a good case. I have gone on an appeal against the order of the assessing officer against his uh, demand. I have gone on an appeal. Uh, so uh, do not try to recover the money from me. You give a stay. Uh, you stop the uh, recovery until the disposal of the appeal. That means till the appeal is finalized, till an order is passed in the appeal. Don't recover the money from me. This is a prayer as an assessee that I will make before the appellate authority. I can also make this prayer before the assessing officer itself. That is a separate provision. We will deal it at some other point of time. So basically, I have a right to uh, make an application for the stay of demand that I can do. So what is the stay of demand? Whenever a demand is uh, whenever a demand is quantified by the assessing officer during assessment proceeding, um, uh, the assessee has the a right to apply and ask for. Uh, keeping this uh, demand in abeyance till the disposal of appeal. That is, don't ask me this demand now till the appeal is finalized. Don't ask me the demand now because I have a merit in my case and I every chance that I would win. If I win, what happens? The demand will go off. If the assessee wins, the demand will go off. So if I win, the demand will go off. So don't try to recover it from me. At this point of time, don't try to recover it from me because the matter is pending before an appellate authority. The matter is pending before a commissioner. Okay, in this case, don't try to recover from me. Give me some time till the disposal of appeal. Don't ask from me. In essence, this is stay. Don't ask the demand from me till the appeal is finalized. In, in a very uh, simpler sense, if I can say, in a very crude sense, this is stay. Okay. Uh, now, uh, take a case where Commission of Income Tax Appeals have also passed an order against the SSC. Assessing officer passes an order against the SSC. Demand is there. Then against this, Commission of Income Tax Appeals. I if uh, SSC prefers an appeal before the Commission of Income Tax Appeals. He also um, rejects the SSC's plea and he is also uh, stating that whatever the assessing officer said is right and the demand still is there. The demand subsists, it's still there. Now the SSC will prefer an appeal before the Income Tax Appeal Tribunal. Now this is where the example comes. Uh, watch, uh, please watch carefully. Now the provision relating to uh, tribunal uh, in an appeal before the tribunal in a provision relating to that, there is no express provision given for the tribunal to give a stay. There is no express provision stating that the tribunal can give a stay. They, the tribunal has the power to give a stay like that. It is not expressly given in that statute. Now the question uh, tribunal said that uh, when the matter was before it for stay, it said that there is no express provision uh, giving us the power to stay. Uh, there is no provision in the statute stating that you can stay the demand. There is no such power is there, so we will not stay it. Matter traveled to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court stated that, see, if you don't give stay, you in the sense of the tribunal, the tribunal, if you don't give stay, then what happens is that the appeal itself will not have any effect. They will go and recover the money and go off. Then what is the meaning of the appeal? There is no meaning of the appeal. When the money is recovered and gone, there is no meaning of, uh, of an appeal at all. So, tribunal has the inherent power to give the stay, subject to certain conditions. They will say that, okay, your case has to be finalized within a period of three weeks, within a period of four weeks, within a certain uh, period. We will stay grant and matter, so immediately you have to take it and dispose it of within a, a time frame you have to finish it off. Or they may say, okay, you deposit only 30% of the demand, deposit only 20% of the demand, balance you will not uh, deposit. So, they can give some conditions and order for the stay. You, you follow these conditions and then I will give you stay of the balance for the recovery. So, subject to the conditions, stay can be granted. So, the tribunal has the power to grant stay. If the tribunal is refusing to grant stay, then there is no meaning in the appeal at all. The, the department will come and recover the money and go. Whereas, I might have uh, merit in my case. When the matter is there, the tribunal, tribunal will ultimately decide it will make my favor. So, rather than making it a provision and negatory and nullity, you have to give effect to every provision. So this is the terminology pertaining to this. Uh, you trust Magus Valiant from the day. Okay, so here we go. So next is uh, harmonious construction. Harmonious construction, if you say, whenever there are two provisions, and whenever there seems to be a conflict between two provisions, 
you have to interpret the provisions in such a way that uh, both the provisions can be given it. It, it should be interpreted harmoniously one it's, it is not to be said that one will not take effect rather only one will take effect rather you have to uh, put it in such a way that both the provisions can be given effect now i see the time uh, is one hour uh, annapurni how much do, do i have any specific timelines vaishnavi annapurni anyone Ah, yes, Anupurni, how much? I, I just noticed that uh, it's been one hour. So, your, your voice is not clear? Your voice is not clear? Can I go on? Okay. Uh, your voice is not clear, Anupurni. I, I, I'm going on. I'm, I'm continuing. Okay. So, uh, this is one aspect. Next is uh, harmonious construction. Yes. I will, uh, there is an example I give you. See, there is an apparent conflict between two provisions of uh, representation of people act between uh, section 33.2 and 133.8. Accordingly, one section stated that government servant may nominate or second a candidate seeking an election. So, one section says that government servant can nominate or second a candidate seeking election. Another section says that he is not entitled to, government servant is not entitled to assist a candidate in an election in any manner except casting a vote. So one section says that uh, you can nominate and uh, second a person for, uh, who is contesting an election. Other section says that a government servant cannot, uh, uh, not, uh, he cannot assist a candidate in any manner except casting his vote. So it appears there is a conflict. So apart from vote, I cannot do anything. If I am a government servant, apart from voting, I cannot do anything. So, does it mean that I cannot uh, propose a second uh, person for election? So, this question came to be uh, interpreted. And the court held that uh, on a harmonious interpretation of both the provisions, it means that the government servant can nominate and second a person for seeking uh, for elections. Also, he can cast his vote. So, both the provisions should be harmoniously interpreted. Rather than making one provision as uh, negatory and giving only effect to one provision, it should not be done that way. Both the provisions should be harmoniously interpreted. So this was this question. Okay, so next thing we go is a uh, very important aspect, rule of beneficial construction or the Hayden's rule. So uh, there is there was a case law called uh, Hayden's, uh, Hayden, Hayden and uh, Based on this case law, this rule came to be called as uh, Hayden's rule. So, it is also known as uh, mischief rule or uh, purposive construction. So, when it comes to this particular rule, you need to see that there are four parameters to be seen. So, there are four considerations to be seen for applying this particular rule. One is this, what is the law before the act? Before making this act, what was the law? What was the defect for which the law did not provide? What was the mischief for which the law did not provide? Second. Third is, what is the remedy that the act has provided? What is the remedy the act has provided? And fourth is, what is the reason for the remedy? So these four things to be kept in mind when interpreting a statute. That means what? You should see, the, uh, according to this Hayden's rule, the courts must see that before enacting this legislation, what was the prior position? Number one. Number two, what is the defect that is sought to be uh, rectified by enacting this law or enacting this provision? Second, third is that what is the remedy which the act has provided? According uh, to the defect, there should be some remedy. How does the act give this remedy? What is the remedy? Third, fourth is what is the reason for the remedy? What is the rationale behind this remedy that is provided by the legislation of act? So these four things must be kept in mind. I will give you an example. See, in income tax, there is a section called as 50C. You must be studying, you must have studied this, you must be aware of this 50C. According to this section, uh, whenever a sale consideration for transfer of a capital asset is less than the 
stamp duty value sale consideration or transfer of an asset is less than the stamp duty value then the stamp duty value would be deemed to be the sale consideration it will be only the stamp duty value would be deemed as a sale consideration so this is this provision take an take a case where this provision is coming to interpretation that this provision has to be interpreted and if you are going to apply head and through this for example if you have to apply head and through this case, what are the four things we need to see first what is the law before enacting this 50c before 50c what was the law whatever was a sale consideration accepted by the parties that will be uh, this, that should be considered as a sale consideration for the purpose of computation of capital gains okay <coughs> what was the defect or the mischief which the law did not provide say suppose the stamp duty value is 1 lakh rupees okay and actually the parties are transacting it for 2 lakh rupees In example 1 lakh rupees is the stamp duty value and 2 lakh rupees is the actual transaction value but but the parties are recording this transaction for 50000 rupees In the sale date what is the amount they are putting as sale consideration 50000 rupees 50000 rupees is what they are recording in the sale consideration in, in the sale deed 1 lakh rupees is the stamp duty value but actually the transaction value is 2 lakh rupees so what happens sale consideration is taken as 50000 rupees whereas 1 lakh 50000 rupees would never come into the books at all it will be a it will be it, it, it will be a, a portion of uh, receipts which will not come within the taxing value or will not be taxed at all only 50000 rupees will be taxed for the purpose of for the purpose of computation of capital gains so this was the defect so this was the mistake or the defect which the law did not provide so what is the remedy that the law has provided the remedy is that 50c was introduced by stating that sale consideration value that is taken for the purpose of computation of capital gain would be the stamp duty value so in this case okay stamp duty value is fixed as 1 lakh rupees minimum price stamp duty value we will take it as a sale consideration we are not going beyond that at least the stamp duty value so sale consideration wherever wherever sale consideration is less than the stamp duty value then stamp duty value will be taken as sale consideration if it is more than the stamp duty value if you are declaring it obviously that you will show it for computation suppose you are very good as a c you are showing the entire 2 lakh rupees uh, that you have transacted even in your paper you are writing as 2 lakh rupees in your sale deed the 2 lakh 2 lakh rupees will be taken as a sale consideration but where uh, stamp duty where the sale consideration is less than the stamp duty value then we will not accept the sale consideration as appearing in the sale deed we will only take the stamp duty value for the purpose of sale consideration. So this is the remedy that the Act has provided. What is the reason for the remedy? The reason for the remedy is that to avoid black money, to avoid holding of black money, the actual transaction value must be taxed. So in order to avoid this mischief, this section has been enacted. So if there is an option to interpret section 50, there is a if there is a necessity to interpret section 50, then in the background of Hayden Zoom, these four things can be seen. You have to apply section 50C in the context of these four rules. Say and take an example where genuinely uh, the transaction value is only 50,000, where the stamp duty value is 1 lakh rupees. Maybe this the place where the land was sold is such a low lying area uh, where it is surrounded by uh, uh, where it is sur surrounded by. Uh, the surrounding vicinity, the other uh, places, nearby places, it will uh, suppose it is near a cemetery, near a burial ground, a piece of land. Okay, nobody would be willing to buy that land. In such a case, the stamp duty value of that area, suppose, in, uh, say, for example, there is any. Uh, 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 okay, I get the message. Uh, the session can go on to 6.37. Okay, I hope to. Uh, yeah, I will take it. Sure, thank you. Yeah, so where the. Uh, uh, say for example, uh, what you call as a heart of the city. Say for example, Tiruvannur is there. Okay, normally uh, the land price of Tiruvannur would be quite high, but this particular spot which you are going to sell is there uh, near a burial ground, a cemetery that nobody will um, come and purchase that land. In that case, the stamp duty value could be one lakh, but whereas the sale consideration is only fifty thousand rupees. No one is willing to buy more than fifty thousand rupees, 
and the sale uh, was concluded for 50,000 only. The sale did also had the uh, value as 50,000 rupees. In this case, what you should consider for the purpose of 50 C, if you have to interpret in the background of Hayden's rule, what should be the amount taken for sale consideration is only 50,000 rupees. Because the, uh, the reason why the party is transacted for a lesser value than a stamp duty is not hoarding for black money. Genuinely, that price that the place will not fetch such a high price. Genuinely, do not fetch a high price. So the rational, the reason for the reason for which the section was introduced, it is not applicable for me in this case. I, I purchased the land where the value itself would not go more than fifty thousand rupees. So in such cases, by applying Hayden's rule, we can interpret the uh, section. We can interpret the provision. So this is uh, the rule of beneficial construction. Then we move on to uh, next uh, example uh, where uh, Price Competition Act was there. Okay, uh, basically, uh, some uh, even now if you can see lotteries and gamblings are basically controlled. They are really controlled or banned, or they cannot uh, it, it cannot freely happen as a trade. The courts have uh, clearly stated that gambling or betting such things you cannot. Uh, Say it is as a right to carry on a profession. See, constitutionally, all of us have right to carry on the uh, any trade or profession that we like. That is guaranteed by the constitution. Okay, but such betting or gambling, they would not uh, come under this purview. I cannot say that I have a right to carry on any business and do this. So this is either banned or in a very controlled fashion. It will be uh, legislation simply done in a very controlled fashion. So this is something that we need to see. So in this backdrop. Uh, there is a legislation that was uh, made as Price uh, Competition Act 1955. In this case, they wanted to uh, uh, they wanted to bring in the definition of price competition as any competition in which prices are offered for the solution of any puzzle based puzzle based upon the building of arrangement, combination, or permutation of letters, words, or figures. So here, the issue is whether the act applies to uh, competitions which involve substantial skill and are not in the nature of gambling. So Supreme Court, so they referred to the previous law and the mischief and they stated that uh, with respect, if you, if you take the history of this legislation, uh, if you take the object of this legislation, then this competition, what they want to regulate and control is only uh, which is in the nature of a gambling or betting and not where substantial skill is used. See a puzzle, if something like a pseudo or crossword puzzle, it is not a betting or a gambling. You will apply your mind. There is a degree of skill that is required. But whereas a gambling, pure chance of luck, only those games are uh, to be uh, brought under this purview of the competition. That is what Act wanted. And it is not uh, uh, the other games or puzzles which requires considerable skill, considerable uh, skill uh, of the person. So intellect and skill of the person, that is not something which the act wanted to control. So the controlling aspect is only with respect to uh, uh, controlling aspect only with respect to those uh, games which are in the nature of gambling also. So this was the interpretation that was given based on parents. This example I want to share. Uh, next interesting aspect is with respect to conjunctive and distinctive words and or or. See, and is what when a word is to be when two words are connected by the word and it is conjunctive in nature. When two words are connected by the word or or, then it is distinctive in nature. So, how you interpret and or or? So this is the question. So in some cases, uh, or can be interpreted as and, and in some cases, and can be interpreted as or. Okay. So the, whatever uh, the interpretation that you make, whether you want to make and as or 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 as and, that should result in an intelligent interpretation. The result should not be absurd in nature. It should be intelligent uh, interpretation. For that purpose, you can uh, use the word and and can be read as or 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 can be read as and. Okay. One example is uh, in Official Secrets Act, Section 7, it deals that any person who attempts to commit any offense under the act or solicits or incites or endeavors to persuade another person to commit an offense or aids or abets and thus any preparatory uh, to the commission of the offense. Here, 
and is red as oil and is red as oil see it says that uh, uh, soliciting inciting endeavoring to commit any offense or aiding to commit an offense or abetting to commit an offense and it also speaks about preparatory or commission so if you say or solicit or invite or uh, incite or endeavor and then you say and to do any preparatory commission of act then it means you have to do all this act that is soliciting or inciting or endeavor and also uh, a preparatory to the commission of that only if both the ingredients are there then only it, it will be termed as a uh, uh, it will be termed as an offense so that is not what the legislature wanted you could do either one of it it can be termed as an offense either you will solicit or incite or endeavor to persuade another person to commit an offense or aid in committing the offense or abet in committing the offense or you do anything preparatory to the commission of the offense any of them can be termed as an offense so here and was the desk or otherwise what happens only when i do a, any of this or 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 in all these conditions i, I do either of it and all, also i will do i should also do uh, something preparatory to the commission of the offense only then it can be termed as an offense that was not the rashe if, if that interpretation is given it would uh, lead to an absurd result and un unintelligent result therefore the court held in this case that and should be the test or uh, next is a very interesting aspect that i wanted to deal is uh, the aspect of may shall may and shall directory provision and mandatory provision i have uh, lined up certain interesting cases but before that i also wanted to uh, give another example for uh, um head and through see um there is an act called booth and yagna act booth and yagna act in this case um land will be distributed to landless persons so the word used was landless persons so who who can be termed as landless persons in this case landless persons whether it means only uh, people who carried out who carry out agriculture but they don't have any land or people without any land but residing in uh, city businessman who are residing in city without any land landless person can land be distributed even to a person landless person who is carrying out a business in the city whether uh, the land can be distributed even to this person or landless person would mean only person who does not have any land but who is well versed and uh, who is well versed in carrying out agricultural operations so the court held that Uh, with the spirit of the legislation this legislation was uh, made in uh, for the very reason that landless laborers should be benefited out of the uh, out of this legislation so landless persons means it should be only the agriculturalist uh, landless people who are agriculturists and not uh, landless men who carry out business in the city so this is something that i want to share with you now coming back to may and shall okay Uh, normally may means it is uh, directory in nature shall means it is mandatory in nature so when the legislation uses the word shall that means it has to be done it should be mandatory whereas if you use the word may it is only directory in nature so when uh, a provision would be termed as mandatory and when a provision would be termed as directory see two things to it if there is any penalty that is being prescribed for not carrying out a particular thing then you can say that the term is only the term is mandatory you do this if you don't do this i am prescribing a punishment in such a case you have to interpret this word uh, this legislation this piece as mandatory one interpretation should be given as mandatory you take another example where uh, there is no punishment prescribed you have to do this but if you don't do this there is no punishment is there in this case it should it can be termed as directory and not mandatory that is first one second uh, thing to be seen whether to state a particular section as mandatory or directory is that if you don't comply with that provision it will lead to injustice to the party it will become illegal or void injustice will happen if you become illegal if you become void if you don't do that it will become illegal it will become void it will be injustice uh, un injustice would be there for the party in that in these cases it should be termed as mandatory on the other hand by not doing that no injustice will be harmed 
will be caused. There is no harm in that. Or no illegality would happen. No, it won't become void. In such cases, it can be taken as directory in nature. So this is a thumb rule for seeing whether a provision should be read as mandatory or percent or a provision should be read as directory. Okay. I would like to deal with certain examples by way of case laws. Uh, one case law is this, uh, where food inspection is there, right? You, when you give a sample of a particular food item, that will be inspected by a food inspector. And he has to give his report. Timeline is specified. Within 30 days, you have to provide. Within 40 days, you have to provide. Whether uh, this timeline is directly or mandatory was the question. It was held that this timeline is only directly in nature and not mandatory because by uh, not providing it within a particular frame of time, there is no penalty that is being prescribed. No injustice would be caused. But the other side argued that, okay, what if my sample becomes stale? My sample becomes unusable. In that case, the court held that. If that is the case, then the inspector can call for fresh sample and do it. So that way, this uh, in this provision, it was held as it is only directory in nature. That is, the timeline to provide the report on the food analysis is only directory in nature and not mandatory. This is one thing. Uh, second thing is that where may the word may was read as, uh, was read as shall. See the point in this particular aspect is this: when the provision has to be read, uh, read as mandatory or directory is one thing. Second is when may can be read as shall and shall can be read as may. That is also something that we discuss. In one case where may was read as shall. What is that case? It's uh, in Hindu Marriage Act. The act says that marriage may be solemnized between two between Hindus. Between two Hindus. So here they stated that the argument was that that uses the word may. That means it is only directory in nature. So the other person can even be a non-Hindu. The court held that no, having regard to the preamble of the law, having regard to the uh, provisions made under the statute, may should be read as shall. So for Hindu marriage act, the parties who are going to get married, they should be two Hindus, they should be Hindus. It is not applicable to non-Hindus. So here, may should be read as shall. That is another case. Again, uh, another case is similar to Hindu marriage act, uh, 1955. Of course, this is now repealed in 1976. This has been modified subsequently. In the previous provision, how it was there? Uh, when, uh, when uh, there is a divorce decree that is being passed by the court, after such a divorce decree is passed by the court, if the parties want to remarry, then they have to wait for a period of one year from the date of that uh, decree. Suppose decree is passed on 1st of January 2020, then the parties want to remarry, then they can remarry only after 1st of January 2020. After a period of one year only, they can remarry, not before that. Okay. Um, so, this provision, it used the word shall. It said shall. It, is, it shall not be lawful for the parties to marry again unless one year has elapsed from the date of the decree. The court stated that this shall can be read as may. This can be read as a directory provision and not a mandatory provision because uh, all, uh, as a, if we want to look into the consequence, the law prohibits, but there is no consequence in the sense if you remarry within a period of one year, there is no penalty that is being prescribed. Within one year, if you remarry, there is no penalty prescribed. Also, uh, it is not void. Just because the marriage marriage has taken place within a period of one year, the marriage does not become void. So all, all uh, unlawful things cannot become void. Here, unlawful is the marriage being solemnized within a period of one year from the date of decree. So all unlawful things need not be void. So here the court refused to accept that shall is a mandatory aspect primarily because there is no uh, penalty or punishment that is prescribed for not uh, following the provision that is Next is that, uh, next example is where any order is passed by an administrative officer, any office is passed in order. In that order, if the law prescribes that reasons are to be given in writing for the order, then that means it is mandatory to give reasons while passing the order. If the passing the order, if in the order, in the order, reasons must be there. It is mandatory in nature. Next example that I can give is with respect to essential commodities act. 
So the essential commodities act uh, under this act, powers are given to officers to seize certain goods. When such a seizure takes place, such a seizure takes place, the officer who has seized the goods, uh, he can um, even dispose the goods if he thinks that the goods will be perished or it will deteriorate in value. There is a loss in value. In such a case, the goods can be uh, sold. Here, this provision uh, that the officer should ensure that the value of the goods should not deteriorate, that the goods should not be perished. So he has to take steps to protect the goods by either disposing it off or selling it off that way. This is held to be mandatory because the very object of the Essential Commodities Act is to uh, give some protection to these essential commodities. So in such a case, in such cases, there is a duty for the officer to ensure that the value of the goods does not deteriorate, that the goods does not perish. He doesn't have any other way out, then he can dispose it of. It is a man, it, it was understood to be mandatory. Then another example that I can give for uh, this may and shall is this. Uh, in forest service rules, forest service rules, it held that uh, whenever the conditions of service causes any undue hardship, see there will be conditions of service, right? You have to do this, this, this. So if the conditions are causing hardship to the employees, then the governor may consult with the Union Public Service Commission. And after considering uh, the terms of the environment, uh, the conditions can be relaxed to reduce the hardship. Okay, you need not follow these things and give you relaxation. So, such relaxation can be given after consulting. So, whenever a hardship is there, the governor, he may uh, consult with the Union Public Service Commission. Here, the term may was read as shall. So, they said whenever there is any hardship being faced by any employee and whenever there, there has to be any relaxation of these conditions to be sought, then the governor should mandatorily consult with the Public Service Commission. It was made as mandatory. May was here read as shall. May read as shall. Here. Okay. Yet another example that I can give is this. Uh, where in Electricity Act, suppose there is an accident under the Electricity Act, then the Act mandates that within 24 hours, the person should uh, report about this accident or only after that he can take any steps. The court held that Suppose it is not possible for the person to uh, give the uh, give it in writing within a period of 24 hours, like maybe he is injured, maybe he is incapacitated because of this accident only, then how do you expect that person to come and give it in writing within 24 hours about the accident? So here the court held that it is not mandatory. See, imagine accident takes place and the law mandates within 24 hours you have to come and uh, inform us about the accident after that you can take any other steps. It can't be held as mandatory. It is very much possible that he is hospitalized. He is in coma stage. He, he is in, in such a position that he is not able to come and give the complaint at all, come and give it in writing at all. So, therefore, it was held that it is only directory in nature and not mandatory. So, these are some examples that I thought I shall, I can give you with respect to may and shall. So, normally, may means it is directory and shall is mandatory, but the courts can um, interpret may as shall and shall as may. Next, uh, we move on to rule of adjustment generous. Very interesting, very important. Adjustment generous. Okay. Adjustment generous means what? It is. It means same kind or species. Adjustment generous means same kind or species. Okay. So here, uh, whenever the act uh, enumerates certain words, and special words are given in the beginning, followed by general words. A, B, C are special words. D is a generic word. In such a case, general word. And they all belong to the same class. They all belong to the same class. Then this general word should be uh, taken as applying to the things of the specific words. This is a justum general. So you have item A, B, C, D, which is very specific in nature. And you have D, which is quite general. This D should be restricted with respect to this specific words. That general word cannot be very general. It should be restricted to this specific words which are there in the beginning. So this whenever a general word follows specific words, 
this uh, this rule should be applied. I'll come to it because there is a slight distinction between ecosystem generous and massacre associate. I'll come to it now. But for ecosystem generous, understand this rule first. Specific word should be there. For, uh, for uh, following the specific word, there should be a general word. Then this general word will be interpreted in the light of the specific words. And all these words must constitute the class of genus as such. Uh, example is, you can an act permits you to keep uh, dogs, cats, cows, buffaloes, and other animals. See, dogs, cats, cows, buffaloes, other animals. So dog, cat, cow, buffalo are very specific from one. Other animal means it is quite vast. Other animal is quite general. So how this other animal should be interpreted? Other animal should be interpreted in such a way that it should be uh, taking its color from the specific word. It should be restricted with respect to the specific words that are appearing in the beginning, in the front. That is, other animals can only mean other domesticated animals like horse, etc. And it cannot mean, other animals mean it cannot be wild animal. It cannot be wild animal like lion or tiger. Okay, so other animals means you cannot say, it, it only says other animals, I can even bring lion or tiger. No, other animals in this context has to be read with respect to uh, cows or cats or dogs as mentioned in the beginning. The specific, uh, specific words as mentioned. Okay, another example is the words uh, arms, ammunition, gunpowder or any other goods. So, uh, prohibition on importing. Okay, the law is with respect to prohibition of importing. So, you cannot import arms, ammunition, or gunpowder or any other goods. So, can you mean any other goods mean machinery? Can I say some technology? No. Here, any other goods, it is a very wide word, it is a general word, but this word should be restricted or uh, it should be taking color from arms, ammunition, or gunpowder. So, something that is similar to arms, ammunition, or gunpowder. So, any other goods cannot be very very vague, it cannot be very open stating that it can be anything. No, it is not like that. It has to be very specific to, uh, and something similar to arms, ammunition, or gunpowder. Okay, so this is another example concerning existence. So, if you see the common pattern, uh, specific words will be there in the beginning one or two or three or four specific words. After that, you have a general word. Then you can uh, term it as the word. then you can apply this rule of existence generous. Okay. I will give you another uh, example. Here, uh, the words charges were used first. Charges, rates, uh, duties, and taxes. So here, charges was a more generic word. It came in the beginning. After charge came the word, came the words uh, rates, duties, and taxes. Here, the court said that we cannot apply the principle of existence generous because the word charges came in the beginning. Had charges came subsequent to uh, rates, duties and taxes, then we can say the charges will take the color of uh, rates, duties and taxes. Uh, I mean, you can apply a to this. But here, the general word came first and specific word came, uh, came next, it comes next. So therefore, a distant general is not applicable, but non-sensor associa is applicable. Another rule is non-sensor associa is applicable. What is non-sensor associa? Non-sensor associa means uh, the words will take the color of the company it keeps. Okay, here uh, general words cannot follow specific words uh, if there is no specific order. If you have four or five words and uh, what and if you want to take the meaning of one word, you have to see it in the color of the other four words. There are five words, and if you want to take the meaning of one particular word, it should be seen in the light of the other four words. It means it doesn't matter which is first or which is subsequent. Okay. And understand that narcissist associa is a broader group. Under narcissist associa, you can find existent genders. So, narcissist associa is a much broader rule under which you can say that existent genders comes. Okay. So, some example like betting act. Betting act prohibited uh, places like house, office room, and other places. So, here only covered enclosures is applicable, whereas uncovered places is not applicable okay and uh, so there are certain examples so looking into the time i am giving only one example we are already six now so we need to cover uh, something more and also give you general contract so uh, this example should be sufficient i i, I present this then uh, when you can apply existent generous rules when 
you can apply this when the statute contains an enumeration of specific words various words must be enumerated and the enumeration constitute a class or a category it should be a particular class or category and this category should not be exhausted by enumeration see when you are enumerating if you say all the items in the class this rule has no application at all in the particular class if you say some item if you leave out some item the other items can also be taken up but if you enumerate everything in this class this rule will not be applicable then general terms must follow enumeration and there is no indication of a legislative intent excuse me so other uh, what are the other rules of interpretation effect of usage effect of usage is nothing but customary in nature okay uh, what is uh, contemporaneous at that point of time what other piece of legislation was there at contemporary position what was uh, the law what was customarily followed so these things are effects of usage Uh, for nonsense or associa, I can give another example. Uh, entertainment, the word entertainment would have a meaning. Normally, you understand entertainment as theater, musical, or performance oriented. But when it is used for uh, refreshment, resort, entertainment should be, uh, would take color of the associated words. This is another example for nonsense or associa. Now, we go to the internal age of construction. So what are the internal, see, again, coming back to the basics, you want to interpret a provision, you want to know when there is any ambiguity, when there is uh, no clarity on a particular term of the statute, you want to find out what the meaning is, okay? When you want to find out what the meaning is, you look into various sources. That is how we have harmonious rules, we have uh, maiden's rules, we have beneficial legislation, literal rules, grammatical rules, etc. So these are all one aspects of how you try to understand the meaning. How the meaning would have been? What would have been the meaning aspect by the legislature? This is something that is uh, there. These are all rules, basic rules. Apart from that, some internal aids of construction if you take, these are like long title. So you know that all legislations will have title, long title. Okay? It, it will not be just a simple title. Say the uh, Supreme Court advocates practice and high courts act. It's a long title. Okay. Then similarly, if you take uh, Black Money Act, you normally say Black Money Act, but again, it is a very big law. You say it is uh, prevention, imposition, or I mean, it's, it's a big one. So it is a long title. So long title is uh, you can take the help of a long title to understand what uh, to understand the statute as such. To understand the provision in the statute, long title can be used. Next is preamble. What is preamble? In constitution, we have something as preamble. In every law, we have something as preamble. In constitution, we have declaring, uh, there's quite a lengthy uh, aspect when it comes to uh, preamble in constitution. Just give me a moment. So what is the preamble of the constitution? We say, uh, we, uh, the people of India, so we, the people of India, having solemnly resolved to constitute India into a sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic, republic, and to secure to all citizens. You, you have this, uh, this uh, particular aspect, when you look into it, you have this a preamble. So, preamble for a particular legislation, if you take, it expresses the scope, it expresses the object, it expresses the purpose. Scope, object, and purpose of a particular act is comprehensively explained in the preamble. So, you can take clue from the preamble also. To understand a particular statute, you can take clue from preamble also. And there are uh, issues that come up, whether preamble is a part of the law or not, part of the legislation or not. So, when it comes to constitution, it was held that preamble is indeed a part of the legislation. It is indeed a part of the legislation. You cannot say that preamble is outside the constitution. 
preamble is inside uh, indeed a part of the constitution so it is not outside there are two case laws to this one is the re birbari union case which held that preamble is not a part of the constitution whereas the keshavan and the bharati case held that preamble is indeed a part of the constitution so as far as constitution is concerned preamble they held that it is a part of the constitution this con uh, this issue came up before the supreme court in the context of amending the basic structure of the constitution whether power to amend includes even the basic structure of the constitution the constitution uh, gives various rights and duties uh, it also gives the power to amend the constitution the question was that whether even the basic structure of the constitution can be amended so the court held that the basic structure of the constitution cannot be amended and held that preamble is indeed a part of the constitution so but preamble cannot override the plain provisions of the act the act is very clear the provisions are very clear you go with that preamble cannot override the plain provisions of that but you can take the clue you can take the understanding of the preamble understanding from the preamble when it comes to interpretation then heading and title of a chapter if you take uh, heading and title of a chapter even these can be an aid to interpretation what the heading says based on that you can write your chapter what is the title based on that you can try to interpret the provision but again coming again telling uh, uh, repeating the same thing they cannot override the plain provision they cannot go beyond the plain provision so whenever there is an ambiguity you can try to take clue from the heading or title then marginal notes marginal notes whether you can uh, resort to marginal notes as an aid of an interpretation as an aid of uh, as an aid to interpreting the statute marginal note is what like uh, constitutional assembly debates before the constitution was passed there would be lot of assembly debates why a particular provision has to be brought in or not there was a lot of debates between the experts at that point of time so they held that marginal notes can be used for interpreting the constitution but whether the uh, marginal notes can be applied for other legislation that is there there is a conflict of opinion whether you can apply the marginal notes for a particular legislation for interpreting the statute there is a uh, conflict of opinion in many cases to understand the statute marginal notes can be accepted as an interpretative aid you can use marginal notes for uh, trying to understand uh, to get the meaning to, for interpretation you can use marginal notes next is definition sections normally uh, many uh, almost every act almost every act will have definition sections so uh, the meaning of a provision can be taken up from the definition section and whatever is given in the definition section that should be the meaning that you can take for a particular word okay so the definitions can also be helpful in interpreting a statute then restrictive another important aspect often asked in the examination also please concentrate restrictive and extensive definition uh, whenever the definition says means word is defined to mean that means it is exhaustive it has covered everything means this that's all that means you cannot bring in anything else into its scope so mean so whenever the word mean is used in the definition it is exhaustive okay whenever the word include is used in the definition it is extensive includes the word includes a b c and d that means not only a b c and d anything else can also be brought in within this definition but if the word uses the word means a b c d that's all means only this it means only this you cannot go beyond that and bring it bring anything else into the definition clause but if the words used is include the word uses include then it is not exhaustive it is not restrictive that but it gives an extensive meaning which includes uh, so many other things also then similarly means and includes the word means and includes a b c d e f that means it includes uh, that means a b c and d and includes anything else also again means and includes the word means and includes is found in the definition clause it is again very extensive in nature and not restrictive in scope so, to put it very simply if the word uh, if the provision contains only means only the word means it is restricted we cannot go beyond that if it includes means if it says mean uh, sorry if it says includes if the section says includes 
the section says means and includes the section says to apply to and include in all these cases it is not restrictive it is exhaustive okay the word mean alone is used it is uh, restrictive it cannot travel in the word include is used the word means and include is used that means it is extensive and doesn't stop with whatever is being given in the definition this is very important then deemed to include again if the word deemed to include is used that again is quite uh, exhaustive and it is not uh, i mean that is quite extensive i'm sorry deemed to include means it is quite extensive and not exhaustive it doesn't stop with certain items it is quite uh, extensive then ambiguous definition where a definition you cannot try to understand at all are not able to understand the definition or it is creating ambiguity in the definition itself in such cases we have to uh, try to understand the definition in the context of the primary legislation in the context in which the legislation itself was made say in an example i give an example termination of service of a seasonal worker after the work was over is not retrenchment as per the industrial dispute act to terminate the service of a seasonal worker seasonal worker he will work only for that particular season okay to terminate his service after his work is over it doesn't mean it is a retrenchment but if you retrench a daily wager who is engaged in the project after the project the project is completed a daily wager is there project is completed you terminate the services of the daily wager then it would amount to retrenchment if at the beginning itself the worker is not told that Uh, his employment will come to an end after the end of the project. If you are not telling that, then it will amount to retrenchment. So, ambiguous definition should be seen in the light of the uh, legislation, principle legislation. Then, illustrations. Illustrations are what examples given in the uh, below the section. You can in contract act, you can find in uh, transfer property act, you can find very many illustrations which are given. Illustrations can also be taken. as a aid in interpreting the statute and uh, <clears throat> illustrations cannot travel beyond the scope of the main word however illustrations cannot uh, travel beyond the scope of the main word that is something that we need to understand next important aspect often asked in your examination uh, proviso proviso exception proviso and exception what is a proviso proviso is a is a part that qualifies the main enactment it says that uh, say for example the statute is enacted uh, particular statute is enacted and proviso is there provided you follow these conditions this will be applicable to you so proviso is that part of the enactment which qualifies the main enactment it accepts something out of the enactment okay it carves out something very Right, the comes out from the main enactment. So it is a proviso, basically that is called as proviso, um, and uh, it will qualify the preceding enactment. It will qualify the preceding enactment. And uh, what is uh, exception? There is a distinction between proviso and exception. Though uh, it can be understood that the same thing, proviso and exception has slight variation, slight distinction is there. Proviso. follows an enactment whereas exception is act, is a part of the enactment you say a b c except d if you say that it is a part of the enactment whereas proviso is something that is qualifying the enactment the particular condition is given and for applying that condition provided these other conditions must be followed particular uh, statute is there section is there for applicability of that section these conditions must be followed then it is called as proviso but if uh it accepts something that means it is a part of the statute it doesn't follow the enactment exceptions doesn't follow the enactment it is a part of the statute so that is the difference between proviso and exception so proviso uh it embraces the field which is covered by the main provision it carves out an exception to the main provision so proviso cannot operate on its own okay you cannot simply say i am going to interpret the proviso you cannot interpret the proviso proviso has to be interpreted in the light of the main enactment okay then saving clause what is saving clause normally saving clause is like in a repealed act okay when an act is repealed uh say companies that 1956 was there 
So after uh, 30, on 30th August 2013, that came into effect. Prior to that, companies had, uh, until uh, the previous day, companies had 1956 of them. So many litigations pending would have been there in companies that right? Many acts would have been continued to be done in 1956 that right? Saving clause means that an act is repealed. Any rights or obligations that are vested based upon the previous legislation will not go away. Any litigation pending in the previous uh, legislation, arising out of the previous legislation, will continue even in the new legislation. For that purpose, those sections will still stand. Repealing means what it is removing as if the act never existed at all. That is repeal. Okay. So in the whenever an, any act is repealed, there will be saving clause, stating that uh, the previous rights and uh, obligations will continue. Any litigation spending will continue. So these things will continue. It will not affect the repeal of the act will not affect these uh, these particular uh, acts. Okay. That is uh, saving clause. Similarly, uh, when there are two or three uh, streams, when you introduce the saving clause. If one is void, other will still operate. In a, in a deed or instrument, if you say, if one particular uh, act is completely void, then by, 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 by virtue of saving clause, other acts can be continued. So that is again saving clause. Explanation. What is explanation? It will give a uh, meaning to the main section. It will give a meaning to the main section. It will give what is the intention of the act. If there is any vagueness, that vagueness will be removed. Clarity will be given and it will give an additional support to the purpose of the act. Explanation gives an additional support to the purpose of the act. Then if there is any gap in the main legislation, this will fill up the gap. And uh, however, explanation cannot take away the right conferred by the main uh, section. So explanation helps in understanding the main act, uh, helps in giving the object of the main provision. So that is why that is where we have explanation. Then schedules. In normally in the, all the uh, most of the laws, we have schedules. Schedules can also be taken up for interpretation. The next important aspect in interpretation is um, all the statute must be read as a whole. The, you read the statute as a whole and then only interpret. You, you cannot interpret the statutes in bits and pieces. That you cannot do. Then coming to the external aids of interpretation. What are the external? So internal aids is something that is there in the act itself. A long title, preamble, uh, proviso, exception, explanation. All this is there in the act itself. External aid means something that is outside. What are they? Historical setting. Uh, at what point of time this legislation was uh, uh, enacted? Okay. Then what was the custom? What was the previous act? How we take the previous act? Whether the later act as uh, giving any explanation for the previous act? What is the dictionary definition? What is the foreign decision? So these are all external aids of interpretation. So these are all coming out of uh, the act. These are outside that, but it will be helpful in understanding an act. Uh, I mentioned about in pari media, uh, like a provision of appeal concerning both direct and indirect taxes if it is there. If you are not able to get a satisfactory meaning in one particular act, you can go for the other act and try to get the meaning. That is uh, in pari media and other acts. So these are some um, external aids. So dictionary definition again, dictionary definition, if you don't have any definition in your main legislation, you cannot find it in, even in general process act, then you can go for uh, dictionary definition, technical definitions you can also take a little be helpful, but only thing is that you have to see in which context uh, the word appears. When you're using the dictionary definition, you have to see how the word appears, in which context the word appears, that needs to be seen. Then foreign decisions. Now we talk about the Indian decision Supreme Court. When looking at the foreign decisions, you can also take the help of foreign decisions. If the law is very new, we don't have enough uh, sources or materials to understand a particular word, then there is an ambiguity. But there is another uh, decision in some other country. In that case, you can take the help of a foreign decision also. In one of the judgments, the judge has stated that uh, we will use our uh, sources for interpretation, but we will take light from wherever it comes. So foreign decisions are such lights coming from some other place. So you can take the help of foreign decisions also.
So these are some aspects in interpretation of uh, statutes that I wanted to uh, share with you. Similar is the interpretation concerning instruments and documents. Only thing that I wanted to share when it comes to instruments and documents is that the court will see uh, that when, it, when the court is looking at instruments and documents, it will see who has drafted that, how much of a knowledge that person has. See, there is a difference between a professional drafting a particular uh, piece of instrument and a common man drafting. So, how a common man will word a particular clause or how an advocate will, a professional will word a particular clause. So, these things will also be taken care of at the time of interpretation. Similarly, any word that is appearing in an instrument, that word if it is appearing throughout the uh, instrument, then it has to be given the same meaning throughout the instrument. At one place you cannot give one meaning, at some other place it cannot give another meaning. So, if a word is appearing in many places in an instrument, it has to be given a uniform meaning based on the complete reading of that particular instrument. So, these are uh, some uh, concepts relating to interpreting a deeds, uh, documents or instruments. Primarily it is all the same, but only thing is that when it comes to legislation, when it comes to acts, it is even more exhaustive. Whereas when it comes to, because you have case laws and other interpretative techniques, but when it comes to instruments and deeds that are between the private parties, like an agreement, a contract and all, so you would have to take special uh, care when you interpret such documents and seeing that how the party would have, say for example, a bill. A bill would be ordinarily written by a person, his intention of bequeathing a property to some uh, people that, uh, some party that he, he likes to uh, give the property. So in what context that was written, so all these things should be seen at the time of interpreting. So these are some things that I wanted to share when it comes to interpretation of statutes. Now we will quickly go to general clauses act okay very many uh, concepts are covered in the interpretation of statute itself certain uh, uh, concepts that are appearing in general process act they are covered in interpretation itself so we will see the balance uh, uh, things in the general process act so why is this general process act is necessary so basically this is necessary to shorten the language okay everywhere everything cannot be given in all the central legislations everything cannot be repeated again and again instead common things can be put under one statute this will be repeated everywhere so i'm putting it in one statute that is the general process act okay other things will continue uh, other things will uh, take effect from the respective legislation so common things we will have it in one legislation so that it will shorten the language we are going to repeat everything again and again each act will run to thousands and thousands of pages already we have the legislation running to many pages. You want to repeat it again, it will run to thousands and thousands of pages. So, to shorten the language of the central lines. Then, uniformity in expression. See, one act will be drafted by uh, one draftsman, another it will be drafted by some other person. If they are going to give us a particular word, a particular uh, definition which is common to all the acts, each person will draft in his own sense. Right? Each person will draft in his own sense. So, to avoid that, uh, to provide as far as possible uniformity should be there. So, for that purpose, general process act is there. Then, uh, to give some convenient rules for construction. Okay, to give some convenient rules for construction. Then, another thing is that while drafting a legislation, you cannot expect everything to be covered at that point of time. So, something might be left out by oversight. So, if there if there is any uh, assistance that we can take, we can take from general process act to see that if there is some omission in this particular act, we can refer to general process. Act that way. Okay, so basically it is uh, called as law of the laws and it is applicable throughout uh, India and its main purpose is to shorten the language and to give an uh, uh, uniformity in expression. Okay, one example is catching of fish, whether it would come under uh, immovable property or movable property. Okay, immovable property is defined in General Process Act to say include land, benefits to arise out of land and things attached to the earth or permanently fossil to anything attached to the earth. I repeat it again. Uh, immovable property includes land, benefits to arise out of land and things attached to earth or permanently fossil to anything attached to the earth. So, this is the definition of immovable property as appearing in General Process Act. To take Transfer Property Act, it, define, it does not define the term except to say that immobile property does not include standing timber, growing crops or grass. This is the definition. Immobile property does not include standing timber, growing crops or grass. Now, 
you have a better equipped definition in general process act now i want us to uh, discuss this important uh, case law when it comes to this uh, immune property see there is this case law called shanta bikes the question in this case was that whether uh, timber whether it is movable property or not standing timber whether it is a movable property or not see immune property states uh, as per the general process act immune property uh, includes land benefits to arise out of land things attached to it or permanently passing to anything attached to the earth transfer property says it does not include standing timber growing crops or grass so as such trees are immovable properties trees are immovable properties but standing timber is not an immovable property standing timber means um timber as such if you look at it if it, if it is in a tree format it will continue to take its source and sustenance from the earth like a tree if it stands as a tree it will continue to take it uh, take its sustenance from the earth in such a case it will be an immovable property but if you just have to cut it and directly take it for making furniture or wood, or wood items in that case it cannot be termed as an immovable property that is the distinction that is made out so general process act defines that benefits to arise out of land things that are attached to earth permanently pass into anything attached in these cases tree is held to be an immovable property but a standing timber which can be straight away cut and taken up for uh, furnitures or making of wood that would be a known as movable property because if it is a tree it will continue timber as such will continue to take its source from the earth in other cases where the timber can be cut and straight away uh, used for furniture in that cases it is only a movable property this is something that i want to discuss now coming to this uh, example that i was telling you fish whether it will come under the category of immovable property or movable property the court applied um, general process act and held that fish right to carry or right to catch or carry fish is an immovable property because it is a benefit that is arising out of land you have a right so it is an immovable property and not a movable property and even transfer property doesn't specifically bar uh, stating that uh, about right to catch fish it only states that it does not include timber growing crops or grass transfer property states that immovable property does not include standing timber growing crops or grass so fish does not come into this category of definition the general process act and hence it was held as a right to catch fish or right to carry on the activity of catching fish is a immovable property okay then uh, the next thing that i wanted to uh, go over this a uh, basic understanding of uh, general process act the preamble we have already covered in the preamble definitions also we have covered in definition uh, i just wanted to take uh, two things in this we wanted to discuss two things in this mm. see the definition of the word security is not appearing in companies act okay but it is defined in securities contract act so you can take the definition of security from the uh, securities contract act similarly the word digital signature as used in companies act it can be construed as per information technology act then definitions means includes we have completed next uh, next uh, we will uh, handle certain definitions in general process act okay the word act act includes commission as well as omission illegal omissions okay uh, act means you commit something not just committing alone will come under the definition of act even omitting something if it's if you are omitting it illegally even that would come within the purview of act so act includes both commission and omission there is an example given in indian penal code say a person causes another person's death by a series of acts first he is giving a blow he is beating him he is giving a blow then he is uh, not giving him food at proper time he is refusing to supply food at proper time see here refusing to supply food at proper time is an omission to give food is the correct thing but he has omitted to do it so even this omission also constitutes an act so accordingly he has caused 
death by series of acts. One act is blowing, acts is hitting, then refusing to give food at proper times also constitutes act. So act includes not just commission. Commission is committing something, doing something. Omission is not doing something. If it is not legal, that will also in, uh, include another term, act. Then affidavit, this is again an examination question for you. Please concentrate. Affidavit, the meaning of affidavit. Affidavit shall include affirmation and the declaration in the case of persons by law allowed to affirm or declare instead of swearing. See, if you take out the meaning of swearing, reservice, affirm and declare, the common thing is that when you affirm and declare on oath uh, and when you swear on oath, when you swear on oath, it means you uh, swear, uh, uh, you swear on God. It is uh, when you believe in God and when you swear on God, that is, that is what is meaning uh, by swearing. Whereas when you affirm and declare, you need not take the oath uh, upon the God. You can only say, I sincerely state and solemnly declare as follows. So, affidavit it means affirmation and declaration. Okay. Who, if, if the parties, if the person is allowed to affirm and declare, and that is known as affidavit. And the definition here is only an inclusive clause. Affidavit includes affirmation and declaration. So basically, uh, you have to tell the truth. Whenever you are telling something on an oath, you have to tell the truth. That is the most important thing. Okay. Uh, it is an inclusive definition. Second thing is an inclusive definition. And you have to tell the truth. So it should be affirmed and declared. Second thing is that it is allowed in persons uh, who is allowed to affirm and declare instead of swearing. So, the person doesn't have belief in God, so he need not swear, but rather he would affirm or declare. Okay. Now, taking clue from this uh, definition itself, there is a definition of oath in the gender causes act, there is a definition of swear in the gender causes act. But if you take, if you read all the three definitions together, it is all the same. It says, if you take uh, swear, it says swear includes affirmation and declaration. Oath includes affirmation and declaration. And it says affidavit includes affirmation and declaration. So, if you take uh, the definition of all the three, it is quite, uh, it is the same. It is the same. Only thing is that you have to tell the truth. Uh, yes, Anupurmi, I get the reminder, it's 33. So, I'll try to find it. So, next important aspect is uh, commencement. Okay, this is very important. Commencement. Uh, see, normally, what happens in passing a law, in passing an act, a statute is that uh, it is first the bill is passed uh, in both the houses, then it receives assent of the president, then it is published in the official gazette. Okay, you have the date of assent given by the president. Then next day or on the same day, it will be uh, published in the official gazette. If the date on which the law is given in the official gazette, the date uh, which is given in the official gazette, that should be taken as the date on which the law is come, on which the law comes into force. The date on which uh, the guess, uh, the notification the gazette is published, that should be taken as the date on which the act comes into force. Suppose, suppose, please be uh, attentive. This is something I have seen in your uh, examination question. Come and see. Suppose in the notification, it states that this will be with effect from so and so date. Suppose, uh, say, take this example. On uh, 25th of April, President gives his assent. On 26th of April, uh, the act is published in the official gazette. And in the official gazette, it states that the provisions will take effect from 1st of May. Then the date on which the, uh, the act can be said to commence is 1st of May. Either the whole act you can say it is said to commence on a particular date or some uh, provisions alone can be said to commence on a particular date. See, Companies Act 2013 is a classic example. Not the entire act came, in, came on the same day. Some provisions were held that these will come into effect on such and such a date. Notification is granted on such and such a date. It will come into effect or in subsequent periods. So, uh, so it, it is like this. Whenever you have the date on the official gazette, that should be taken up as the date 
In the gazette, if some other date is mentioned, that is the date in which the act comes into effect. It is called as entry into force. It is called as entry into force. Okay. Then document. So document, again, this is an examination question for you. It includes any matter written, expressed, described upon any substance by means of letters, figures, or marks, or by more than one of those things. I think we discussed this in interpretation of statute. So we are moving on. Okay. Next, the word enactment. Enactment means not just the legislation. Even a section can be termed as enactment. Even a rule or regulation can also be termed as an enactment. Okay. Then financial year. Financial year starts from 1st of April. Calendar year starts from 1st of January. Okay. Uh, but where the financial year is uh, defined in the respective acts, that should be taken care. So that general causes that whenever there is no definition, you come here. If there is a definition that is there, then you take up the definition as appear in the respective acts. Then good faith. Good faith is not defined in contract act or any other. And it's not defined in contract act, but good faith is defined in general process act. So if you do an act with due care and attention, without any malefied intention, then you can call it as a good faith. Like whatever a prudent person will do at that point of time, if you're doing it in uh, without uh, any malefied intention, with, with due care and attention, then it is called as good faith. Okay, this again I found it in your examination as a examination question, where um, you are making a purchase of a particular removed property, maybe a land, you are purchasing a land, okay, but you are not making any inquiry as to who is the owner. So whenever you may, you purchase a land, what you will do, you have to uh, do something as title due diligence. You have to trace the title to see whether the person who is coming forward, coming and coming uh, and selling it to you, is the person indeed who is the owner of the land, whether he owes a title or not. So this title must be ascertained. If you ascertain the title and you are satisfied that this person is indeed the owner, is indeed uh, the title holder, then if you purchase, it means that you are acting, you have acted in good faith. Okay. Simply you blindly you just go and purchase a land without even verifying who the title holder is, then. It can be said that you have not acted in good faith. So you have to do a person of a reasonable prudence. How you will take due care uh, in entering into a transaction without any malefied intention, you have to act accordingly. So if you are going to purchase a land without any inquiry as to, the who, as to who the title holder is, then you cannot be said to have purchased it in a good faith. Okay, when you have not done any inquiry, you cannot say that I have you have purchased in good faith. You have not done it in good faith because you have not done the basic inquiry. You have blindly followed and you just blindly you have gone ahead and purchased the plot. So uh, that is one example, an examination question for you. So government government includes both central and state government. Okay, wherever the context appears, you have to use it. Then immune property, we have already dealt with immune property. Then month, month means a month reckoned according to British calendar. Okay, period of 30 days. Month uh, was construed to mean a period of 30 days and not a month. See, in income tax, uh, uh, the example that I'm trying to put in here is in income tax act, month it was held in section 271. Month would be month of a period of 30 days and not a month as defined in the general process act. Now, the person, the definition of person as appearing in general process act would be company, association, body of individual, whether incorporated or not. Person shall be included only an inclusive definition. But if you take income tax act, it is quite exhaustive. Individual, partnership form, body of in, uh, body of individuals, association of persons, whether incorporated or not, company, artificial juridical persons. So it is quite exhaustive, but even then it is only an inclusive definition. Uh, but in, uh, but general process act, as far as person is concerned, only the inclusive definition holds only three parties. Now, um, coming to effect, I have already dealt. Presumption against retrospective, retrospective. So, that means what? Whenever a legislation is made, it should always be understood that it will be applicable only from uh, only for the future, only going forward. It, it, it will not be retrospective in nature unless language specifically states that the statute 
will have its applicability as a retrospective operation. Normally, we find in Income Tax Act a lot of retrospective amendments are made. So, in many cases, even though the words used are uh, with effect from backdated like 75 or 80, the courts have come across and said that it, it is only prospective in nature, even though you use the words retrospectively, even though you use the words you know, for, the, uh, for the purpose of clarifying. See, whenever the words used are for the purpose of clarifying, it is normally presumed that it is retrospective in nature. But in Income Tax Act, in very many cases, courts have stated that even though the words for the purpose of clarifying it is there, still it can be termed that the legislation is only prospective in nature and not retrospective. Retrospective means going back. The law will be applied from the backward period. So it is always presumed that the law is only applicable from the forward period and not backward period. That is the meaning of presumption against retrospective. And this, uh, the language is very specific that it is retrospective. There is no uh, question of uh, legislation, legislature being acting from a backward period, from a long period. In effect of repeat, we have already dealt. Then commencement, uh, yes, this is another important aspect, commencement and termination of time. Okay. See, uh, normally in appeal cases, you will be given a time limit for appeal. Right, 30 days for first appeal filing. Uh, say, for example, income tax act. If you want to file an appeal against order of the assessment, a 30 days time limit is given for you to file an appeal. So, how to construe this 30 days? Suppose you receive the order on uh, 1st of June. Okay, 30 days means 1st of June would be left out. The day counting should start from 2nd of June. Okay, and 30th day within 30 days. That means on 1st of July. You should have uh, at least on or before first of July. You should have filed the appeal. So thirtieth day ends on first of July. I am repeating the example. You are receiving the order on first of June. You have time, thirty days time to file an appeal. The first day should be left out for the purpose of counting thirty days. Second day must uh, June second must be taken up as the first day. Second of June is your first day. Okay. If you count from second of June, the thir thirty days will end on. 1st of July. So, 1st of July is the last day. 30th day would be ending on 1st of July and the appeal should have been filed on or before 30th July. Okay. Having said this, having said this, if uh, the last day, suppose the 1st of July is a holiday, it's a declared public holiday. In that case, the appeal can be filed on the next day, next working day. Say, for example, 1st of July is Friday. It is a declared public. Suppose some declared public holiday is there on 1st of July. Saturday and Sunday government is not working. And if you want to file an appeal, then you, you can file it on for, uh, Monday. 1st of July is a Friday, 2nd Saturday, 3rd Sunday, 4th of Monday, you can file it and it will be taken still within the time limit. Okay. Then see, again, measurement of uh, distances. Normally, measurement of distance means it should be measured in a straight line on a horizontal plane. But uh, take in, in Income Tax Act, agricultural land, aerial measurement is provided. I want you to go through that to just have an understanding about it. The General Process Act says measurement of distance means straight line on a horizontal plane. Then gender and number, very interesting gender and number. Male includes female and singular includes plural. Okay, whenever the act uses he, 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 it doesn't mean that the word is used as he, so it is not applicable to women, not like that. Male includes female. Okay, if he is stated, even she should be assumed to be stated. But if it is a gender specific legislation, like uh, Succession Act, Hindu Property, Property Succession Act, Hindu Property, Hindu Law, Property Act, in that cases, you cannot uh, state that. Uh, male includes female. There, it is very specific. It's a gender-based legislation. So there, male is only he, is only he, and she is only she. But where the legislation is uh, gender neutral, then uh, male includes female. Okay. Then powers and functionaries. So, uh, Whenever the act gives uh, any power for a person, then that person can uh, carry out that power that conferred by the act. Then that includes even appointing an ex officio. Ex officio is normally a person who is already there in the position. By virtue of that position, he is also a member, similar to that. So 
power to appoint x at each row. Similarly, power to appoint will include power to suspend or dismiss. Okay. If the act says you have the power to appoint and it stops, it doesn't mean that he has only power to appoint. Dismissal or suspension is not applicable. It is not like that. Even dismissal and uh, suspension is also applicable for that. Power to appoint include power to suspend or dismiss. Okay. Then uh, substitution of functionalities. Uh, if uh, it is sufficient to mention only the official title means in the name of the functionary to give the official title at that particular time that is sufficient. Similarly, another aspect is that if an officer has to carry out a particular act, if a subordinate is carrying out his act under the instruction of the officer, that will be sufficient, uh, that will be uh, presumed that the officer himself has carried out this act. Next is, um, so these are some important aspects. Uh, I wanted to quickly discuss on bylaws because I found it in your examination question. I will just uh, tell about this bylaw, this example. Okay. Mm -hmm. See, uh, where the act gives some, uh, bylaw gives some qualification, it says that only these qualified people can be appointed. This is a previous law. Subsequent law is silent about it. In that case, it says that a person can be appointed. In that case, it has to be construed that the person who is qualified will be appointed. Okay. Then a power is given to make bylaws and rules and regulations even after the commencement of the act and before and after the commencement of the act. And whenever you publish a particular act, uh, if the act gives you certain steps, like you have to draft it, you have to send it for public comments, and then you publish it in the official gazette. Once an act is published in the official gazette, no questions can be raised about the methodology, like how whether the process is right or not, no question can be raised. It is conclusive that all the formalities are done properly. Once it is published, no question can be raised about the procedural formality of publication. It is presumed that all the formalities have been completed. Okay. Citation of enactments, that means you, you, you can uh, cite the short title that is sufficient. If you don't, you not cite the entire title whenever you're citing legislation, the short title would be sufficient. So these are some aspects that I wanted to deal in the Other Causes Act also. So I thought I uh, gave you an overview about the uh, interpretation of statutes and the Other Causes Act. So now any questions I am willing to take up. I have not seen any question in the uh, this thing in the window. So this is it. This is something that I wanted to share and discuss. Annapurni, thank you. Thank you all. I couldn't see any of your faces, so Vaishnavi, Anna for me, any of you? Anapurni, you are visible, but I'm not able to hear.
Yes, Rubika. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. So, no questions? Not sure whether it is problem at my end, network problem is at my end or Yes, so, okay, no questions. Thank you so much. Thank you one and all. I thank uh, the branch for this wonderful opportunity and all the students. I'm not able to see any of you, but whoever is present, I uh, uh, thank everyone for your patient caring. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I thank everyone who are part of this webinar i extend my thanks to the chairperson of the branch ca geeta ma'am and to the sikasa chairman ca satyanarayanan sir and other branch officials for giving this opportunity my hearty thanks to uh, chairperson students committee of the branch ca madhumita ma'am for giving a special address i on behalf of sikasa of kanjipuram district branch extend my sincere thanks to the session speaker ca muttu abirami ma'am for giving your valuable time to us today's session on general clauses act and interpretation of statutes were uh, very uh, informative for us ma'am thank you so much i extend my thanks to the sikasa team for coordinating this event i once again thank everyone who were part of this webinar thank you all Thank you, Rubika, for your uh, word of thanks. Uh, I hope the students who you can also ask for queries in the comment section, which will be uh, uh, which will be responded within a few hours. Uh, uh, as far as the new topics are concerned, no.